<laughs> Don't worry, little kitty. Just say Hakuna Matata and have one. <laughs> hey, friends. I know, just like kitty, many of us might find it icky to even think about eating insects. So, in today's episode, let me explain the history behind our relationships with these crawling creatures and answer an inedible question. What if we eat bugs? Zoom in! Imagine you are enjoying the sweet taste of your favorite fruit and as you take another bite, you are shocked to see that there is a worm wriggling inside it. And worse, it seems to be half eaten by you. So you panic and scream. What will happen now? Well, all I want to say is just relax. I know that entomophagy, meaning the act of eating bugs, isn't on the menu of many of us. But you won't believe before humans had tools to hunt or farm, insects such as crickets, termites, beetles, dragonflies and many others were an essential part of their daily diet. They probably learned what was edible by observing the animals around them. And even after humans evolved and civilization formed, insects were still an active part of everyday food and delicacy in many parts of the world for centuries, including ancient Greece and Rome, where insects like cicadas and beetle larvae were considered as luxury food. But around 10,000 years ago, when farming and domesticating animals started to expand, our affection towards eating bugs began to change. And slowly, we lost the taste for these crawling, wriggling, chirping food items. And the majority of the world's population started to feel yucky, even with the idea of entomophagy. But that's not entirely true, my dear friends. Yes, entomophagy, or eating bugs, is still practiced and at least 2 billion people actively consume nearly 2,000 species of insects even today as part of their diet. Take for example, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, caterpillars are abundantly available all year round in markets. While in African countries, insects such as juicy mopane worms are mostly eaten by the natives. Whereas in Southeast Asia, many insects, including the giant tarantula, cooked in different ways, are increasingly marketed to tourists. I know what you guys are thinking, but why do we or should we eat bugs? Well, that's because insects are a healthy food source with high protein and energy-rich fat content. Not only that, but they also contain various vitamins, minerals, fibers and you won't believe they have as much calcium as milk and iron as spinach. But nutritional value is not the only reason eating insects have been encouraged in today's time. Yes, entomophagy can also help to tackle the increasing global food crisis and save the world. That's because insects produce fewer greenhouse gases responsible for global warming and farming them takes less land space, water and food compared to livestock. So, next time, if you mistakenly munch an edible bug, don't feel yucky. Just think of it as an opportunity to save the world. Trivia time! Did you know in Congo, families eat as much as 96 tons of caterpillar per year? Also, if you think bugs might not taste good, 
then you'll be surprised to know that mealworm tastes like roasted nuts. Roast locust tastes like shrimp and stink bugs have an apple flavor. Hope you learned something new in today's episode. Until next time, it's me, Dr. Binox, zooming out. Ho, 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 ho. Oh, never mind. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Phew. That was close. Hey, friends, I know you must be wondering. Why am I carrying this small box so cautiously with care and precaution? Well, in this box lies a bottle of sweet, golden and natural honey. And I need to deliver it to my aunt without wasting a single drop of it. I know, I know you guys must be like, what's the big deal in it? Well, friends, we all know that honeybees make honey. But do you know, it takes a great effort and hard work from bees to make the honey we enjoy. If not, then don't you worry friends. Today, let us go into the buzzing world of these tiny chefs we call honeybees and learn the recipe for nature's sweetest dessert known as honey. Zoom in! Well friends, honey is sugar which mainly constitutes of fructose and glucose made by honeybees living in a large group called a colony. This colony lives in a hive and has thousands of female worker bees who make the honey. First, the worker bees, who are also known as forager, visit flowers containing sugar water and then with the help of their hollow straw-like tongue called proboscis, they suck up the nectar from the flower and store it into its tummy. While returning to their beehive, digestive enzymes are already processing to turn that nectar into different parts of sugar like glucose and fructose. Once the worker honeybee returns to the hive, they vomit the nectar into a processor honeybee's mouth. I know it sounds yucky, but please bear with me, friends, cause it's going to get yuckier. But anything for science and desserts. Go away, go away, kitty. Shoo, shoo. After breaking the nectar further, the processor honeybee vomits the partially converted nectar into another processor bee's mouth. This process goes on until most of the nectar turns into simple sugar. Then the bee moves this watery honey mix from its tummy into its mouth and then stores it into the honeycomb. But this new nectar mix is still quite watery and gooey. So to get rid of most of the water, the smart bees flap their wings which evaporate the water leaving the thick mixture we know as honey. Trivia time! Did you know that in its whole life, a single bee only produces about one and a half teaspoon of honey? Whoa! Get out of my way! Worker bees have to fly a whopping 55,000 miles to produce a pound of honey. And it takes about 556 foraging bees to visit 2 million flowers to do so. Phew! Suddenly, the homework seems an easier task to do, isn't it? Also, honey is a precious gift of nature to us as it is full of vitamins, minerals and has many medicinal benefits. Beyond that, honey also has many antimicrobial and healing properties linked with it. That's why, my friends, we should value the efforts of honeybees and cherish every drop of honey. Achoo! Whoops! See you soon 
with more fun facts. Until next time, it's me zooming out. Oh my! Oh, hello kids. It's not what you're thinking. I'm not scared of that mosquito. Okay, now since the topic is buzzing around, let me take you into the creepy world of this blood-sucking, biting, itching, tiny creatures. The most dangerous predator on the planet who is responsible for the death of billions. It's none other than the mighty mosquito. So, let me tell you more about these pesky little creatures. Zoom in! Mosquitoes are part of a large group of insects called flies and are found everywhere in the world, including in your houses. There are nearly 3,500 species of mosquitoes, but they all serve just one purpose. They bite and suck blood. So, how do they do it? Let's find the answer to this itchy question. After finding its prime target, the mosquito will spread some saliva on its prey skin that acts like an antiseptic in order to numb the spot so that you don't notice its evil intention. Then it buries a part of its mouth deep into your skin. This part is known as the proboscis that kind of looks like a straw. With its proboscis underneath your skin, the mosquito hunts for a blood vessel. When it finds one, it again releases saliva into the wound which contains a substance called an anticoagulant that keeps your blood flowing. And if it succeeds, one mosquito can drink blood up to three times of its body weight and can transmit potentially deadly diseases like malaria, dengue, Zika, etc. And if not that, it inevitably leaves an itchy red bump on your skin. Phew! Thank goodness you can't see this process. Ouch! So, what can you do to treat the mosquito bite and make the itch go away? First of all, don't scratch it. As tempting as it might be, avoid scratching mosquito bites. Scratching can further hurt the skin. Instead, wash the area with mild soapy water. This process will often help decrease the itchy sensation. Trivia time! Did you know that only female mosquitoes bite? To reduce the chances of getting bitten and contracting a mosquito bone disease, start using a mosquito repellent. So kids, I hope you have learned a lot about these tiny devils that bite us, annoy us and stop us from playing outside. But the most important thing we learned today is that no matter how deadly mosquitoes are, I am not scared of them. <laughs> oh, ouch! Help! Okay kids, see you next time for some more fun facts. This is me zooming out. Help! Hey friends, how are you today? <laughs> there I go again. I just can't get this song out of my head. But hey, there's something else that's rattling my beard right now. Hmm, what's that? Whoa, there goes a butterfly. Come, let me tell you about the life of a butterfly. Zoom in! There are four stages in the life of a butterfly. The egg, the caterpillar, the pupa and the full-grown butterfly. This life cycle is known as metamorphosis. A butterfly's life starts inside a tiny little egg. The egg can be of various shapes and colors. They have a thin but tough shell for protection. 
at the top of the egg, there is a small pit called the micropyle, through which air and water enter the egg. This stage lasts for about 3 to 7 days. There is a developing larva inside the egg. When it is time to hatch, the larva tears open the eggshell with its jaws. The larva is called the caterpillar. After hatching, most caterpillars finish eating their eggs as their first meal. Then they feast on the plant on which they were laid. This is the main feeding stage. Caterpillars eat all the time and grow very quickly for about 2 to 5 weeks. When the caterpillar reaches its right size, it finds a suitable place and weaves a silk pad around it. It's called a pupa. If you open your eyes and look around in your garden, you could be lucky to spot a pupa on a twig, a branch, or a leaf. The protective shell of the pupa is called chrysalis. After a period of one to two weeks, a very beautiful butterfly spreads its wings and tears the chrysalis to come out of the pupa. And that is how you see such beautiful butterflies flying all around you. The average lifespan of a butterfly is 20 to 40 days. Trivia time! Did you know that butterflies usually taste with their feet? And have you ever noticed that butterflies generally sit on flowers and not branches and leaves? That's because they drink the nectar from flowers. So kids, you know what to do now. Grow more flowers around you to play with this beautiful insect called the butterfly. This is me zooming out. Tune in next time for more fun facts. Oh, why go scratchy, scratchy, little kitty? Kitty got lice! Well, well, well. Lice are pretty common not only in animals, but humans too. <coughs> That's an interesting question to explore. Hey, friends. So, in today's episode, let us put our heads around these tiny creatures we call lice and answer an extremely itchy question. What causes head lice? Zoom in! Lice are very tiny whiny insects that are only about the size of a sesame seed. But don't get fooled by their small appearances as they are a kind of parasite which feeds on their host's blood. They are divided into two main groups, namely sucking lice and chewing lice. Sucking lice are found almost exclusively on mammalian hosts, including humans. In contrast, species of chewing lice are commonly found on bird species, feeding on hair, feathers and epidermal skin or scales. Although petting those irritating guests on your scalp can be an embarrassing experience. But fortunately, lice are not a sign of poor hygiene or a cause of disease and are very common. Yes, every year millions of people get them and most of those millions are kids and teens. But the worst part is they can quickly spread from one person to another through head contact. Or if lice are stuck on things like a comb, hat, hairband, cloth, etc. And that thing touches another person's head, that person may also get lice. So, if any of your classmates get them, chances are in no time the rest of the class might get them too. Once lice gets into your scalp, they also start to lay eggs known as nits that look like dandruff or dirt. 
So, to tell them apart, try pulling those tiny specks with your fingers as dandruff and dirt can be removed easily. But nits stay stuck on the strand of hair and can be hard to pull off. In that case, ask someone to use a magnifying glass or a bright light to help you with proper inspection. If you find the nits yellow, tan or brown, the lice haven't hatched yet. If the eggs are white or clear, it means that the lice have hatched. Although these tiny creatures aren't a threat to your health, but too much scratching can lead to a scalp infection, which raises a vital question. What can we do to get rid of these unwanted guests? Well, if your head feels itchy a lot lately, kindly speak to your parents or guardians ASAP as they can quickly recognize the nits or lice just by looking at them. Once they find the culprit, your parents can remove them with hands by using a fine tooth comb on your wet, shampooed hair every three or four days for a few weeks. And if the problem still persists, it's better to consult your doctor who will examine your scalp and suggest a special medicated shampoo, cream or lotion that removes lice. And if you think someone you know has lice, then it's better to maintain a bit of social distancing for a while and not check comb, hats, clothes, etc. that belong to them. Trivia time! Did you know lice can survive up to 30 days on a person's head and can lay 8 eggs a day? Also, head lice can only survive on humans and can't live more than 2 days without us. Hope you had fun today. Until next time, it's me, your best friend, Zooming Out. Never mind.